Hi, I'm Dr. Michelle Perro, pediatrician, 40 years boots on the ground, thanking AgEmerge for inviting me to speak with you today. Not my typical group, but happy to share some of my ideas with you. And what I thought we'd talk about today are neurobiotics and neuronutrition. And before I get started, you're probably saying, what is she talking about? I'm going to explain and how I use this topic in terms of depression and mental health in children. And I'm really going to focus on depression today, and it couldn't be more timely, and I'm going to show you why. So let's get started. So today we're going to talk about bugs in the brain. Maybe you have a few. And here what is what we're going to cover. I'm going to go over depression, probiotics, and mental health. I'm going to make a few definitions for you. Talk about bugs in the brain, uh, neuronutrition, what that means, a few treatment strategies, ACEs, adverse child, um, childhood experiences, and I'm gonna go over that at the end of the talk for the big Broadway bang moment, and root cause analysis, and I'll also explain what that's about. So now you have an overview of what I'll be covering. So medical talks, we start with definitions. Depression, an illness that involves thought, mood, and the body. It affects the way a child feels about themselves, how they think about themselves, sleeping, eating, and the way children think are affected. And it could present with a variety of symptoms. Look at the list, helplessness, guilt, feelings of worthlessness, loss of energy and appetite, or gain of appetite. It can go both ways, a little carb bloating at night. Um, lack of interest in daily activities, sleeping too much, sleeping too little, both ways, self-loathing, and unfortunately, suicide ideation and suicide completion. So what do we think about in medicine? We talk about depressed kids. We think about a depressed mood and clinically significant depression, and which both basically interfere with a child's capacity to function. So there are both, and I don't think there's anyone listening today that hasn't had at least a depressed mood at some point in their lives. If you're married, you certainly have. No, I'm just saying. But yes, we've all been depressed at some point. Prevalent at every age. This is pre-COVID. These statistics now are pre-COVID stats. In the US, 16% of kids report depression, and teens have a much higher rate um, uh, than that. I think actually that 16% is a little bit too high. It should be a little bit lower, like 9%. That, that's a typo, folks. But it's still really high. But since COVID, it's even higher. And it's the third leading cause of death in people aged 10 to 24 years. This is significant. And for you pictorial learners, let me share a graph with you. Depression and anxiety, they're linked. And then you can see on the x-axis, do people know what the x-axis is? You know, people are like, what, what that, what's the x? Well, that one. You can see depression shoots up percentage-wise in teens, anxiety, the same. Behavioral disorders, oh, look at that, mid-childhood, that's where we see a peak in behavioral disorders. Um, so that just lays out pictorially the lay of the land. Yes. Babies, babies can be depressed as well. And there are different types of depression in kids. In mainstream medicine, we think of depression as one type, and I'm gonna go over this again. You'll hear me say the important stuff over a few times. In medicine, we hear things over and over and over that we need to learn. You farmers probably do the same thing. Um, maybe part of other mood disorders could be associated. It doesn't mean you just have one thing. You could have more than one thing. It could be related to underlying medical conditions like hypothyroidism, an epidemic in kids right now, and particularly women. It could be related to uh, pharmaceuticals that the kid is taking, or uh, recreational drugs can cause depression as well. I mentioned babies can be depressed, and this is what I found interesting, that um, bifidobacterium, that's a microbe, and you're gonna start hearing me talking about microbes during this talk, um, is effective on depressive-like behaviors in mice. Now, we are not mice. Well, rats, maybe. No, I'm kidding, we're not. Well, some of us are rats, but no, mice. And we extrapolate a lot of our information from animal studies in humans. That's how we do it. So yes, yeah, some of these babies are very sad indeed. But what's really been, you know, 
I've got a bug in, in my bonnet, um, is COVID and the effects from COVID. And this is not a COVID talk, because I know you've all had COVID like right up to here by now, right? We are COVID overloaded. I, I am, I can't read another email about COVID, but I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the effects of mental health on children from COVID. And a study came out recently, a few months ago, that suggests socially isolated kids experience higher rates of depression and anxiety long after lockdown. And loneliness increases the rate of depression three times in the future, which, is, which creates an impact on mental health, which can last up to nine years. So I hope there are a lot of therapists out there being training because this wave of COVID kids will likely produce depressed adults. And what we've also seen from this study, it was a meta-analysis. They looked at a lot of different studies together that the duration may be more important than the intensity. So lockdown for kids has to end. That's my little piece. Kids need to go back to school. It'll improve parent health as well. So when we look at the kind of things that cause depression, what's at the top of my list? Oh, environmental toxicants. Oh, well, why is that? Because they are the one of the leading causes of chronic disease in children. Yes. Now, they're not environmental toxins. Toxins are organic. Toxicants are inorganic, like pesticides. Diet. Diet, diet, diet. The main focus of my treatments on my patients is diet. And then, what did I say? Oh, diet. Okay. Depressed parents. And not just mom. Dad, too. Dad, yes, dad's involved, because dads have to step up to the plate here. Dads and moms, yes. Um, co comorbidities, what do I mean by that? Prematurity, sleep disturbances, obesity can also be involved with depression. Obesity causes a uh, decrease in self-esteem and all the effects from a low self-esteem in children. Young moms, yeah, that like 16-year-old moms, also risk for depression. And then there are psychological contributors like poor social skills, negative body images, particularly in teens, conduct, dis conduct disorders like ADHD, um, ADHD uh, affecting about 10% of kids now. I think it's up to about 12%. Um, learning challenges. If you go into a classroom now, it looks like a who's who of learning challenges. And if you go to a lunchroom at the school nurse, you'll see the kids lining up for their meds. Take a trip to your kid's school. Um, and then again, these adverse childhood experiences, which again, big Broadway moment at the end of the talk, and I'm saving, well, not the best for the last, but I'm saving it for the end. So when I talk about depression, I like to look at the risk factors because it affects all of us and all our children. Life stressors, poverty, bullying, shaming children, don't shame kids, discipline them, but don't shame them and exposure to violence, parental conflict, divorce, loss of important relationships, including pets, and at the bottom, social isolation. I already gave you my COVID pitch. I'll stop, I'll stop myself. Not so easy to do, but yes, I'll stop myself. So let me share with you a little bit about, about children's art. And you're probably saying, why is she talking about kids' art? Well, I'm gonna show you why. This is one of my patients. I just got this in the mail a few weeks ago from one of my moms. That was her son who had ADHD, autism, aggressive behavior, biting, thrown out of like 15 preschools, et cetera, gut disturbances, gut brain, gut brain, gut brain. We're gonna talk a lot about that. That was his art three months ago. Then that's his art presently. And art is a great way to assess a child's state of mind as to their artwork and their creative expression. So I discussed this kid's art with a friend and a colleague of mine who does focused arts therapy you know, she does psychotherapy through the arts, and she was amazed at this kid I treated, um, and he went from this kind of fragmented and nervous kind of feeling to cohesion, um, more integrated, and developmentally appropriate art. So again, this is what I'm sharing with you is what we see when we actually treat kids for our mental health issues. So now we're gonna start getting into the weeds. I like the weeds. And I'm going to talk specifically into more specifics about probiotics and mental health. Now, probiotics can affect the central nervous system. It can affect the function, the behavior, which is mediated by something we call the gut-brain access. Yes, these are linked. Um, and the way this works via immune 
uh, humoral, uh, neural, and metabolic uh, pathways, and they can improve uh, gastrointestinal function. Um, they have antidepressant and anxiolytic activity, which means depressing anxiety. Now, the gut microbiota, microbiome, my microbiota, they're relatively synonymous, is involved with immunomodulation and energy balance and activation of the enteric nervous system, which is the nervous system of your gut. It's called the enteric nervous system. Um, dysbiosis, which is an imbalanced microbiota. We have about 85% happy bugs, 15% pathogens, and they should be in a relative harmonious state, but that easily can get tipped. And when it's tipped, it's associated with various diseases of the central nervous system. And in kids I see, let's say on the spectrum with autism, I'd say 90% of them have evidence of dysbiosis. How do I know? Well, there's several ways. I have parents take pictures of the poop. Yes, iPhone photos. Show me the poop. I should call myself Dr. Poop or a poopologist, perhaps, because I can learn so much of looking at the photo. Because one kids are potty trained, parents have no idea what's going on in the poop. You show me the poop, or even in the diaper, I can see what's happening. Or I look at something called the PCRs of the stool. I actually look what's in there. This is new science, and it's not um, occurring in mainstream medicine. Okay, so for example, we know from studies that lower levels of bifidobacteria and lactobacilli, two of the main groups of happy bugs in your gut, are found in patients with major depressive disorder. Okay, so how? How does the microbiota affect this gut-brain axis? And I base my work a lot on the work of Dr. Uh, Ted Deenan, and he coined the term psychobiotics. And I'm going to talk a lot about psychobiotics, and, and that is, it's a relatively new term on how these microbes affect the gut. But I don't like the term psychobiotics. I like the term neurobiotics. I made it up because I don't believe there's a disease of the brain per se, but of the neurotransmitters and the gut-brain axis. And I want to talk more about these neurotransmitters, and I'll go into a bit, a bit more depth because these are the chemical messengers that transmit information, and there are various types, such as GABA, dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine. There are about seven different groups, and they transmit the information. And so this pathway, I think it's important, you could take a little bit of time looking at this slide, the gut talks to the brain via the microbes and the, and the metabolites from the microbes and these neurotransmitters, and some of them actually act like hormones, and the information goes back via the vagus nerve and the enteric nervous system. And there's a backup plan. The body doesn't have just like one system. There's a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, many backups. That's why I usually pre present to my patients and my parents. I give them a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and folks like that. So does the body. So, I like to look at things pictorially. I'm kind of an organized kind of a gal, a little bit OCD, I blame it on uh, my genetics. Um, and I like, to, this is why we're taught medicine, these clinical algorithms. But I think it gives us a nice way at looking at neurobiotics. So, divided it up into three groups, mental health, neurodegenerative disorders, stay with me folks, and neurodevelopmental disorders. And mental health, depression, anxiety, stress. Those are the three big ones neurodegenerative disorders, Alzheimer's, autism. Autism and Alzheimer's have a lot crossover. Alzheimer's disease right now is skyrocketing, Parkinson's. And then under neurodevelopmental disorders, we have ADHD, Tourette syndrome, and dysomnias, which are sleep disorders. Um, I think about two thirds of kids under the age of 10 are now reporting sleep disorders. And the way I get families to do what I say, or <clears throat> my suggestions, I don't bully them. Well, maybe I bully them a little bit. But no, listen, when a kid is not sleeping, parents are motivated to make a change. Oh, yeah, chronic sleep deprivation, parents will do a lot of stuff in their house. Just saying. So let me go into some more specifics. So are we drilling down now? Now I'm going to get a little more specific, right? I'm laying out foundations. Now I want to get into some details. Strain matters. Which probiotic strain? It can be complicated. I think I need a degree like in probiotics. Um, there, the main, like for example, the main strains, let's say Lactobacillus brevis, Lactobacillus uh, plantarum, Bacteroides species, and, and Bifidobacteria dentium produce GABA and serotonin. GABA and serotonin are 
calming neurotransmitters. A lot of folks are low in serotonin. Yes, and we're going to talk about that happy, that happy neurotransmitter, serotonin, serotonin, serotonin. We're going to learn a lot about that today. And it, what's interesting, and even when I was preparing for the talk, I said, I should review these bugs again. I looked up bifidobacteria dentium again, and in the oral cavity, it can produce cavities. Like you say, well, how is it beneficial? Well, sometimes they're, when they have to be kept in check, where they're located, they can be beneficial, and sometimes they can be pathogenic. Yeah, I know, it's a fine balance. It's not so straightforward, this whole probiotic thing. I'm trying to make it straightforward, but there's lots of nuances when we talk about bugs. There's a lot of crossover. Different bugs do different things. So what I mean by that is that spore-forming bacteria like Bacillus subtilis, Clausi, there are lots of uh, bacilli, bacillus, uh, different types of species. They make serotonin from these enterochromaffin cells that line the in, uh, gastrointestinal tract. And that's where a lot of activity happens. And that's where a lot of these neurotransmitters are made. 90% of serotonin is made in your gut. 50% of dopamine is made in your gut. Those are neurotransmitters. Now, location matters. So we have the serotonin being made in the gut, 90%, but that serotonin is a big substance. It can't get into your brain. Your brain is also making serotonin. So you say, well, what's the purpose then? Well, we think serotonin might even be acting like a hormone. Yes, I know. It gets a little bit complicated, and I'm going to stop right there. Um, and I think I'm just trying to give you an introductory talk. So clinical application. How do we use this? Well, here's a study, and I'll give you lots of studies because why? Why do I cite so many studies? So there's legitimacy what I'm doing. I'm not making this stuff up there from the air. Dr. Voodoo here. No, this is like legit stuff. This study showed the psychotropic effects of one particular lactobacilli called Lactobacillus plantarum PS128. Um, and in, it looked at stressed and naive uh, adult mice. And what it found, this one strain, that there were reduced depressive behaviors in mice, hmm? reduced uh, corticosterone, inflammatory marker, reduced inflammatory cytokine levels. We've all heard of cytokines now, right? Cytokine storm, COVID, everyone's starting to get familiar with the terminology. Increased dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. That's your area of your brain that's responsible for executive function which actually doesn't kick in until about 21 to 25 years old. That's right. So don't ask your 18-year-old to make smart decisions, right? No, I don't know what happened you know, to 40-year-olds. No, that's something else. But I'm just saying this activity doesn't kick in until later. Dopamine is responsible. Dopamine is released um, when kids are gaming. Oh, yeah. That's big dopamine surge. Just saying. That's another talk. And increase serotonin. So there are now like lines of, for probiotics you can buy with that one specific um, organism. I don't like treating that way, except in infancy. In infants, newborns, whether they're breastfed or formula, formula fed, I'll use one strain. As kids get older, I bring in different strains and the organisms that live in community together. Yes, they live in community and they quorum sense. They have like a little chat box going on all the time. And you know how they communicate? Like, now that I'm on this, I just might as well tell you. Well, quorum sensing is one way, but by EMFs, electromagnetic frequency. So when we are bombarded with 5G, I just have to do one quick plug on 5G. Yes, it might be affecting your microbes conversation, eavesdropping on them. Um, so beneficial microbes, they prevent the overgrowth of inflammatory lipopolysaccharides. Lipopolysaccharides are toxic substances made by certain bugs, and because most Americans now have something called leaky gut or intestinal permeability, these things leak across and cause inflammation. Now, these LPSs are tricky because why? Why, why are they tricky? They can lower dopamine and serotonin, they increase cortisol, infl inflammation, and increase free radicals. And that's why you need vitamin C to offset those free radicals and glutathione. You need antioxidants. It's in your food. So let's get back to this uh, bacteria brain conversation. And this, I just love this slide. This is from the psychobiotics guy again, Dr. Ted Deenan. He's a psychiatrist. I'm going to talk a little bit more about him. But I got this chart from him. And he 
he laid out here, as you can see, the organisms and the different neurotransmitters they produce. And you may say, wait a minute, strep? Streptococcus? I know strep. Isn't that a pathogen? Well, yeah, depends what strain. Group A strep gives you strep throat and can give you rheumatic fever and some other nasty stuff. But there are different strains and some of them are beneficial. I know, that's the nuance. That's what I'm talking about. So it's all not so clear cut. I'm trying to make it clear cut, but it is nuanced. So there's serotonin, our buddy, our happy mood uh, neurotransmitter. So how do these microbes affect mood? How does it actually happen? So the microbes communicate. I'm just reading here. You can kind of read along with me via the gut-brain access, via immunoregulatory, neuroendocrine, and vagus nerve pathways. That vagus nerve is called the wandering nerve. It's the longest nerve in your body from the gut to the brain. It's usually, it goes both ways, but it's um, generally moving toward the brain. Then these enterochromaffin cells, um, which are in your gut, uh, they line uh, the gastrointestinal tract, and they, uh, they're a type of what we call enteroendocrine cells that make the majority of serotonin, which is released in response to various stimuli, uh, both chemical and mechanical. Microbes send a little text to these enteroendocrine cells in the gastrointestinal tract to produce neuropeptides and neurotransmitters, for which I told you there are seven groups. There are quite a few of them. I just talk about the main ones like serotonin and dopamine and one called GABA. And therefore, abnormal microbiota, um, it leads to altered serotonin production, and it can produce a comorbidity of gut and mood disorders. So when the gut is off, the mood can be off, and when the mood is off, the gut can be off. And so the probiotics play a major role in the regulation of these, of these uh, it's, uh, there's a more terminology um, in these enteroendocrine cells via the vagus nerve and impact neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental disorders through this chat, this crosstalk. So we are microbial, almost 90%, and the microbes are running our brain. So when you have a gut feeling, it's, I got, I got a bad gut feeling, yes, that is your second brain. As a matter of fact, these microbes are about three pounds. How much does your brain weigh? About three pounds. I found that, doesn't anybody else find that quite remarkable? Like, why is that? We now consider this microbiota like an organ, its own organ. Yeah. And you have microbiota all over your body, by the way. You've got it on your skin, you've got it in your eyes, and we have a unique microbial fingerprint. And as a matter of fact, if you go to a lecture hall, and you don't like the person sitting next to you for some reason, and maybe your microbes don't like each other. And at the end of that talk, especially if you've been there all day, you're gonna be sharing little communal microbes together. Isn't that sexy? So, let them eat dirt. She should, right, uh, this, not cake. I wanna talk about sugar in a minute. Let them eat dirt. Look at this mycobacterium uh, vacay. What does it do? It increases the expression of TPH2, it's an enzyme, which is involved in the biosynthesis of serotonin. So farmers, your kids should be healthier, but it depends on what's in your soil. Do you have dead soil, right? Soil and gut are synonymous. So what's in your soil, those microbes affect our mood. And kids from like organic farms have healthier microbiota. Just saying, sharing it with the goats and, you know, and the pigs, it's all good. Dogs, kids who grow up with dogs have healthier microbiota too. You know, the pooch look in the face, that's a probably a good thing, but not after they just look, lick their tushy. I'm not saying that, but dogs and babies, it's a good thing. So, okay, I've been the queen of glyphosate for like a few decades now, and this is not electron glyphosate, but I had to make one point about glyphosate, and who knows more about glyphosate than farmers, but let me just say one thing. So, I talked before about that enteric nervous system, that, that it was what feeds the gut nervous system and talks to the vagus nerve, and what I want to say is that enteric system goes literally from the mouth to the tush. The tush is a pediatric word. And the microbes relate information back and forth via this enteric nervous system. Now, antibiotics, like the fluoroquinolones, I don't particularly use fluoroquinolones, this group like ciprofloxacin, you may have heard of that in kids. I try to avoid them. Just one dose of antibiotics can affect those microbes. Now, glyphosate, right? 
affects aromatic amino acid production in plants through the shikimate pathway. And you guys probably know this. And one of the amino acids affected is one called tryptophan. So in plants, it blocks the production of tryptophan. Tryptophan is the building block of serotonin. Now, when glyphosate first came out, we told we were not affected because we don't have the shikimate pathway like plants do. Hey, wow, awesome. But guess who does? Oh, I think I may have heard it. Yes, your microbes. Your microbes have the shikimate pathway. Your microbes also are blocked by glyphosate. So glyphosate acts like an antibiotic, by the way. Yes, Monsanto now bear patented officially 2003, 2010 as an antibiotic. It's a Wunderkind antibiotic. I read the patent. My sphincter's tight. You already know I have a little OCD. I'm a little bit over compulsive. And when I read that patent, I thought to myself, whoa, this is an amazing antibiotic. And we've actually shown, not I, people out in King's College in London, put out a paper a year ago which showed the exact mechanism how glyphosate messes up your microbial flora. And we've known about it for a long time. We've known it from uh, vet studies in 2013 by Dr. Monica Kruger's uh, group. And she showed how glyphosate and Roundup affected the chicken microbiota caused a decrease in beneficial bacteria and an increase in salmonella and botulism, botulinum toxin, uh, clostridia species. And I think you farmers know that we have a problem with livestock right now, don't, don't we? With botulism, clostridia. Don't get a vaccine, get rid of the glyphosate. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say. So glyphosate, um, well, I'll just wrap it up. That's not all I'm gonna say. But glyphosate causes a disruption in the microbes and um, I'll let it, leave it at that. I think you get the message. So, are we pausing? Are we thinking? Are we reflecting? Maybe. So, how do I start to put this all together? Clinically, I'm giving you a lot of information. Well, let me share with you my world, how I start to bring it together. So, the way I like to look at it is, we have main neurotransmitters like norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, and there's a lot of overlap. It's not like they just do one thing only. No, this is not monocropping. There are many things and they all share different roles. Now, neurotransmitters, as I mentioned, and I'll repeat, are these chemicals, right? And they are released from nerve cells, they transmit impulses from a nerve cell to another nerve cell, and they're messengers of neurologic information from cell to cell. That's what they do and there are these different classes and they all kind of work together or not. So when you have different situations like schizophrenia, high in dopamine, look at that. Look at love. Is there a relationship between love and schizophrenia? Oh, well, maybe I should pose that question to you. I don't know if I'm gonna answer that one today, guys. Um, but what, what I'm trying to say is look at this. Depending on the mood, there are different levels of neurotransmitters, right? Isn't that mind blowing? And so they run our lives. So who's running our lives? Our microbes are running our lives. What affects our microbes? What we put in our mouth. Oh, any 80s people out there? Robert Palmer, addicted to love, just saying. He died early in his 50s. I wondered if he died of an addiction, uh, a hormone imbalance and a neurotransmitter balance, just saying. Okay, I'll leave Robert Palmer. So. There are lots of studies um, um, about food. And now I want to switch over into the role of how what we eat impacts our mood. And the big culprit is sugar. I just had to spend a moment on sugar because we all love to eat sugar, right? Who doesn't love a little sugar? We have birthday cakes full of sugar. We're supposed to eat that once a year, right? You're supposed to have sugar just like on your birthday, not all year long. Two studies that came out about sugar. And it's interesting because Carbs do increase tryptophan. I'm going to show you the, how they do that in a minute. And sugar-rich diets um, induce greater decreases of serotonin in sweet cravings um, in women during stress. But those, the increase in serotonin is short-lived. And people, I think, are very aware of like that Thanksgiving high. They think it's a turkey. It's actually the heavy carb load which I find also interesting. But sugar uses up the body's vitamins and minerals and provides next to none. It consumes a lot of B vitamins. Now, sugar in the sugar cane form does have chromium, but 98% of it is removed when you turn it into sugar. 
Um, and that's a, a key uh, mineral used um, in blood sugar regulation. So I can talk a little bit about this sugar conundrum. And um, I might need to step forward a little bit so I can read from this screen just a bit. I'm going to come forward. I know I can't. I'm just going to read a little bit because I can't see squat. This is uh, another factor from being old. And I'm reading it um, off the slide. Just read along with me, folks, because I didn't memorize this. So high carbs, what do they create? A spike in insulin. OK. You eat a high carb meal, you get a spike in your insulin. So looks like I can read this. I can't. Insulin causes uh, tissues around them to um, kind of block other amino acids. You get greater increase in tryptophan. Now I'll just sum it up, folks. You, you don't need all the details. But essentially what happens is there is a block in the other amino acids. Tryptophan gets into the brain more than the other amino acids. And the increased tryptophan causes increased production of the happy hormone in your brain, the serotonin. And that's what's going on. So you can see that there is a reason why you get a sugar rush. It's real. But then you get the sugar crash. It's not sustained. That's right. And so I remember when I was the first a young buck coming out of my residency, you know, in 1985. Oh my God. Yeah. And so um, moms would tell me, and I just say moms because I didn't see many dads, still don't see that many dads in my practice. We're going to change that. But moms would say, my kid eats sugar. He's a madman. He's hyperactive. He's running around the room. And we were taught like, oh no, really? <laughs> Don't believe mom when she says her kid is bouncing off the walls. Yes, it's true. You can get a real rush from food. I had a kid who was psychotic from eating peanuts. So, I, mm, mm, yes, this is real. Okay, so here's another way of looking at it. Tryptophan, that amino acid, it's basically an essential amino acid. We can't produce it. We can produce some. We can't produce the aromatics. Plants can. That's why we eat plants. But we can't produce it. It makes 5-HTP, and then it makes serotonin. But if you look at the different cofactors in making serotonin, you'll see things like, oh, magnesium and zinc. What are kids low in? Oh, magnesium and zinc. How do I know? I test them. And the way mainstream medicine tests magnesium and zinc is inaccurate. They look at plasma levels, which will almost always be normal. You have to look at red blood cell levels, and you see kids are in the potty. Their levels are low. And if you have low levels of zinc and magnesium, your brain cannot run. You cannot learn. And this is what's going on. We have a deficiency of nutrients from food, from soil, and from 22 years of eating GMOs and their associated pesticides. This is not hard, folks. This is what's going on. This is why it's so important what you do, because we're eating what you make. That's why it's so important. Just saying. No serotonin, no melatonin. Now, one of the treatments now in some of the protocols for COVID, these are mainstream protocols, melatonin. People don't have enough. Made from serotonin, made from 5-HTP, made from tryptophan. And if you don't have the cofactors, magnesium, zinc, iron, B6, vitamin C, all the things we're telling you to take during COVID, your brain can't run. You don't make the happy hormone. So again, back to this guy, Dr. Ted Deenan. You're He's the one in 2013 who coined this term, psychobiotic revolution. And then I kind of lifted it and borrowed it to make neurobiotic revolution, because I think we need to look at mental illness in a different way. But preparing for you guys today, I said, well, gee, I never heard Dr. Ted Deenan speak. I'm going to look at one of his YouTube videos. Because as my 23-year-old told me, mom, you don't know something? Look it up on YouTube. Yes, my kid told me that. And I did. And I heard him speak. He's a psychiatrist from Cork, Ireland. He was speaking to another gastroenterologist, uh, Dr. Uh, Meyer, somebody else. I've read his book as well. And then I'm like, well, listen to his conversation, hour and a half long. But then as he gets into it, he starts questioning autism. Like what? And he started saying that the autis autism spectrum may be overdiagnosed. There aren't that many kids on the spectrum or with these neurobehavioral changes and neurocognitive dysfunction. And I was so appalled, I nearly pulled him out of this talk. But I've been working on my own neurotransmitters for many years, my own gut health. 
And I said, no, no, don't be reactive, Dr. Perro. Let us leave him in. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, my favorite pediatric metaphor. I left him in. But I just wanted to give you the heads up. Yes. OK, I'll move on. That's enough ranting about Dr. Deenan. So prevention, what I want to give you a couple things to do when you go home. Otherwise, you're going to say, like, whoa, what do we do? This doctor gave us too much information. So preconception cleanup. OK, when I talk to families now, I say, no, nookie, nookie. No, 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 no. You got to do a little cleanup first. No making babies until you and dad, not just mom. You notice how I said dad, too have to do a six month preconception cleanup, detoxify yourselves. And how do I do that? Well, clean up the internal milieu first. Organic food, organic food, and then organic food, regen ag, all that, we know that. Filtered water, um, a diet rich with fermented foods. And if you don't eat fermented foods, probiotics. I almost have everybody on probiotics. I take them out almost every day. And then you have to clean up the external milieu Shoes off at the door. Can't get it to happen in my house, so I've been complaining only for 27 years. Just saying. What's the most toxic thing in your house? Dust. Yes, you must dust. You must clean your house. Use those masks, your COVID masks, and clean your house. OK. Detox. You have to drink a lot of water and lemon water because it's alkalinizing, and you want to keep a good pH. Try sweating. I know exercise won't kill you. The sweat is not a harmful thing. and. I have to say reduce your EMFs. I am very EMF concerned, uh, both Wi-Fi and dirty electricity. Every kid is on Wi-Fi now all day long because no one's in school. And I'm thinking, oh my god, what are we doing? So uh, this is the kind of conversation I have pre-conception. And babies inherit that microbes, after mom's all cleaned up, from dad. He contributes through sexual intimacy to mom. Mom passes on her microbial stewardship to baby via a vaginal birth. If it's a C-section, through breastfeeding, otherwise the baby looks like the surgical suite. And then that's how babies get their microbial inheritance, mom's stewardship, and their own immune system um, begins to develop. So love your fermented foods. I'm, uh, most of my uh, patients, I have them read um, Weston Price, Sally uh, uh, Morell, uh, Fallon Morell, or Morell Fallon, Fallon Morell, I believe. And she's written some books. The one I tend to recommend is Nourishing Traditions. And so fermented foods, number one, you need to make your own. So again, my daughter, snappy 23-year-old, mom, look it up on YouTube, how you ferment foods. Like, well, OK, fine, I did. Oh, it wasn't that hard. A couple years ago. <laughs> Hey, I'm from New York City. What do I know about this stuff? You know, I'm not Martha, Martha Stewart. So I learned how to make that fermented food. Oh my God, it was so easy. I couldn't believe how, ridiculous, how ridiculously easy it was. OK, introduce these things early in your kid's diet. What's with the kid's menu? There is no kid's menu in France. If you go to a, a French, OK, this, this will blow your mind. You go to a French public school, they're sitting down eating these full cooked meals, five courses, ending up with a brie at the end. This is what French children eat. And then you know what's in the American school lunchbox, right? Chicken nuggets made from little rat fritters and whatever other pizza and these little peach things that are nuked um, in microwave in plastic. So your kids get a nice dose of the plastic in there and phthalates, which cause all kinds of neuroendocrine disruption. And that's what American kids are eating for school lunches. And some kids eat two meals a day and lunch at school. And that's what they're eating. And kids should get in the kitchen. Boys love knives. Get them chopping early. When my, I, I kind of missed the boat on one of my kids. My son, he didn't get this lecture. And why? Well, my ladies, just hold on. I don't know how many ladies are out there, but this tends to be a female thing. I didn't want my kitchen dirty. This is a disclosure moment. Now I could care less about the kitchen being dirty. Get your kids in the kitchen. OK, they clean it. You clean up later. So this is a probiotic line that I'm trying to create called Stages for Ages. And I want to create a line, if any of you want to join in with me, infancy, toddler, and teens. As I mentioned earlier, during infancy, I tend to use like one strain. Bifidobacterium longum infantis is the one I tend to use. And 
We've known about that for only about 100 years. I, they've got to share this with you. 100 years ago, this pathologist, he does some research, and he looked at fecal smears in babies, and they had like a monoculture of bifidobacterium infantis. It was a, had a different name back then. Why? I'll tell you why. Because bifido makes something called short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids lower the pH. A lowered fecal pH decreases the risk of pathogens, right? Babies who have a lot of that don't get sick as often. They don't get those diarrheal illnesses. Toddlers, I tend to use granules, put it right in their food. And teens, I tend to give them this probiotic. It has prebiotics in it and postbiotics. Oh, yeah. And it's always changing. So I'm always up on the literature. And if I come speak to you ever again, I may be saying something different next year because I have to read a lot. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, huh, look how pretty. All right, little eye candy. So what are the best brain foods so we can deal with depression, anxiety, and how about maintaining normal mental health? What an idea. So there are the foods. Those are my favorites. You can see broccoli, avocados, berries, um, various herbs, evu, extra virgin olive oil, um, uh, turmeric, turmeric, turmeric. I don't know why the slide looks like that, but you get the picture. Turmeric also produces uh, increased serotonin. I put some turmeric with black pepper and coconut oil in my coffee every day. Oh, yeah. And then along with a little bit of bovine bone, a couple of peptides, and then I throw a little maca root in there to balance my hormones. And what else do I put in my coffee? Oh, some flaxseed for omega 3s for my brain health. Just saying, you are what you eat. Regain the brain. There are over 500 polyphenols, and they have different, those, they're all different types. They come from plants. Look how beautiful. This is why, as pediatricians, we say, eat the rainbow. Star anise, peppermint, cinnamon, you got the picture. And these are the health benefits of foods that have increased polyphenols in there. And these polyphenols, they can influence gene expression, um, they influence uh, gut function, and you can see they decrease the risk of diseases like type 2 diabetes, um, they decrease the risk of inflammatory issues, chronic inflammation right now in kids and adults, et cetera, et cetera. They increase uh, a low density lipoproteins, they increase high density lipoproteins, those are the beneficial um, cholesterol molecules, et cetera. And I gave you guys a little bit of chart here. You can see which foods are the best foods that we eat that have high levels of polyphenols. So nutritional deficiencies affect kids globally. This is not a third world problem. This is a first world problem. I see kids who look like this from affluent areas. I work in an affluent area. And I see kids with nutritional deficiencies. How is that possible? Overfed, undernourished. We're seeing deficiencies in folate, B12, magnesium, zinc, uh, vitamin C, et cetera. And children from low-income areas have the worst um, uh, diets and the lowest levels of nutrients from low-income regions across the US. And this is actually a problem um, not just in the US. It's a global problem. It's a problem in China. I did a talk in China, and their kids were a mess too. And it's actually a problem uh, in Africa. Now, Africa is a big place. There are 54 countries in Africa. It's, it's, like, it's a lot of countries. But they, too, have issues with nutrient uh, quality. The nutrients come from the food. So if the soil is, is poor from um, monoculture, from overuse of uh, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, um, this is what happens. And suboptimal nutrition, if we don't get enough omega-3s, decreased brain function. So I give most um, of my mom's prenatally DHA, and I give it to infants DHA. I myself take EH, DHA and omega-3s um, pretty regularly for my own brain function. Yes. So treatment strategies, um, symptoms and root causes. We're always looking on how we balance these two. And as an integrative practitioner, I'm always looking for the root cause. Yes, help you with your symptoms, but really understanding the why. Why are we here? So when we're treating a mental illness, there are therapeutic options. There are many. And one of the first things I'd have to say is get kids in nature. Nature is healing. And it's, and it's that those negative uh, um, electrons that come from trees and in forests are grounding. And in Japan, it's a form of therapy, nature therapy. So when we treat folks, we treat the whole 
patient, holistic medicine. Um, we use nutritional therapy, nutraceutical therapy, advanced nutrition therapy, um, acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine, various forms of psychotherapy. Sometimes we have four, five, six kinds of therapy that we're using at once. Integrative medicine, um, we do various treatments with neurofeedback, transcranial magnetic, uh, I'm gonna show you a really cool thing about trans uh, transcranial magnetic radiation. And um, I'm a big fan of manipulative medicine and osteopathic medicine as well. I send a lot of kids for manipulation, it's not chiropractic, and a lot of times the vagus nerve is trapped in children from birth because of a vaginal birth, and you can release it easy with very simple maneuvers. So that's what I do. So, I just, um, this is to show you that um, in Parkinson's patients, that they, the, a lot of these patients are on something called L-DOPA with all kinds of side effects from L-DOPA. These folks are not my folks, but I think at one point in my practice, 50% of my patients were adults. So I have a little bit of experience with this, and these folks were found to have very low levels of microbes um, in their poop. So we use probiotics to treat and prevent neurodevelopmental, neurobehavioral diseases. Probiotics are also called functional foods. Um, and another name for that are nutraceuticals. We even use probiotics in antibiotic resistance, and it's called microbial interference therapy. And there's a, like, a lot of exciting research about this. I, there's, I'm just gonna quote um, one study which showed that um, this one strain of lactobacillus casei, uh, strain Sharota, they used it in treating kids um, and young people mostly with chronic fatigue syndrome. And there was a considerable reduction in anxiety compared to controls. Now, a lot of these studies have very small patient populations. The more patients you have, the bigger the study, the more power the study has. And one thing I wanna share with you when people say, Show me the data, Dr. Perro, and what you're doing with that. Well, this is what I say. My patients are not like lab rats, okay? I'm not looking to study them. I'm looking to treat them. So I'm not studying my patients. And so often I'll do many things at once because I am not, I'm not putting them in a study. I am helping them resolve their own health issue, giving them the tools so their bodies can heal themselves. That's all I'm doing. So... This stuff is old stuff. This is not new stuff. Pliny the Elder, a Roman naturalist, suggested consuming fermented products would treat intestinal problems. This has been around for a while. Uh, what I'm telling you is not new news. And I just love these Bulgarian old gals sitting around chatting. Um, there's a, a, a scientist in the turn of the, uh, of the 20th century named Eli Metrikoff. And Metchnikoff um, hypothesized that the lactic acid producing bacteria offer protection from intestinal auto intoxication. Huh. He won the uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1908. This guy was amazing. If you want to read uh, an interesting character, read about um, Eli Metchnikoff. And he found that beneficial bacteria could be substituted for pathogens after he observed that these countryside Bulgarian residents, which lived in a poverty state, an unfavorable climate, but they lived to an old age, despite all that, because why? They drank fermented milk products. Interesting. So another little graph showing you all the amazing things probiotics do. Um, I think by the end of this talk, you've got a good sense that they're pretty remarkable. Um, you know, bugs are our friends. Love your bugs. I do want to show you that I've been talking, I've been using this term neurobiotics and that it's not a brain disease, but perhaps a neurotransmitter disease. But I do want to share with you, I don't want to oversimplify this, that there are changes in the brain from depression. And if you do PET scans and other imaging studies, brains of depressed people don't look like brains of normals. But we can reverse these PET scans with various therapies, that list I showed you before, and including this treatment as well, using magnetic pulses to ease depression, because there are a lot of ways to treat depression, not just giving them a drug. Well, let's talk about just giving patients a drug. Now, in mainstream medicine, someone's depressed, what do we do? Oh, well, we give them an SSRI, right? We treat depression as a single entity, but it's not a single entity. There are at least, at least five subtypes of depression, and they all act different. And so children may be given these serotonin, um, uh, uh, their serotonin um, selective 
um, reuptake inhibitors, SSRI, I hope I got that right. But basically what they do is they're blocking the breakdown of serotonin, which increases it. And that works for some of the biotypes of depression in kids and adults for that matter, but not all. So if you're giving Prozac, happy drug, to the wrong biotype of depression, it won't do a darn thing. But mainstream medicine is not considering all these other factors of why we have uh, depression. It's just using pill for ill, uh, symptom-based treatment. So I just wanna shake you up a little bit, because you can see I'm shaken up. So let me shake you up a little. And when I saw this, this is from 2019, I wanna share with you how many millions of children, including the zero to one age group, are on antidepressants. We are drugging our children with pharmaceuticals. To me, this is a criminal act. I don't believe that we should be doing that. I could go on just for a few hours. I don't think Agamerge would appreciate me doing a little dance about that, but I'm not okay with that. I'm okay with perhaps changing kids' diets or giving them real food at lunchtime in public schools. How about we start there? So now, ACEs. Remember, like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, we've been down a few roads by now. I talked about these ACEs thing. Well, I wanna share with you a little bit about ACEs because this is some mind-blowing stuff. Now, these adverse childhood experiences, you can see, um, they affect what we call the HPA, uh, HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary axis, and children are especially sensitive to repeated stress on this axis, chronic stress. And that chronic stress produces changes in this axis and hence their immune system, their hormonal system, their DNA changes, epigenetics, and their life expectancy and these are called ACEs. Now, there are pro-inflammatory cytokines, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. They activate the HPA axis and they enhance the permeability of the blood-brain barrier and decrease uh, serotonin, which can lead to depression. People with high ACE scores, and I'm gonna show you about that in a minute, are found to have altered microbiota dysbiosis. I lecture a lot on ACEs because I'm pretty horrified about it, and if you give me an adult with mm, autoimmune disease, cardiovascular disease, or cancer, I'll show you an adult who has an high ACE score. So I just want to spend one second, bear with me, I'm a little bit on the sidebar off topic here, but it's important. I want to tell you about Dr. Felitti's work. Dr. Felitti, hats off to you, sir. I watched his YouTube, by the way, his YouTube is great. I'm not, I'm not trashing Dr. Felitti. He did a study back in, he published in 1998, where he was looking at obesity down in San Diego, California, and he was trying to figure out why people would lose 100 pounds and then gain it all back. He had an obesity clinic, he's an MD. And then he was interviewing one gal and she said, well gee, I lost 100 pounds, gained it all back. Like he said, what happened? And he said, and he's asking her a million questions, just doing a history, it's what we do, we, we ask questions as physicians. And he said, well, when's the first time you had sexual intercourse? And she said, Oh, um, she was thinking about it. He goes, well, how much did you weigh then? And she's thinking about it. She said, oh, I think I was about 40 pounds. And he said, no, no, no. How much did you weigh when you first had sexual intercourse? And she said, about 40 pounds. He said, how could you be 40 pounds? And she goes, well, I was four years old. He said, well, oh, whoa, <laughs> light bulbs. Occasionally we docs have a few light bulbs going off. And I've changed a few before I came here today. But I want to say that he started figuring out that, well, Jay, wait a minute that somehow, and he brought into his study, that people who suffered traumas as children went on to develop diseases later in life, obesity just being one, there are about 10 different disorders, and you can see the more negative things that happen to children, like, like what? Divorce, abandonment, um, drug addiction in the family, mental illness in the family, incarceration, bullying, shaming, a sibling with chronic disease. These things, there are acts of omission and acts of commission, cause changes in health later in life. He created a questionnaire. There are 10 questions. And if your score is greater than four, you have an increased risk of all those diseases and depression way up there. So when we wanna figure out the root cause of depression, look at somebody's childhood. Okay, that's all I'll say about that. So let's look at Mark Twain. <laughs> like, Jesus, all over the place. Mark Twain, I love Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, there is no such thing as a new idea. 
We simply take a lot of old ideas and put them into a sort of mental kaleidoscope. So what I'm saying is a lot of the stuff I'm sharing with you today has been around for a long time. We're just reimagining it. I'm not saying anything really new. This has been around since Pliny the Elder. And this guy, Dr. George Porter Phillips in 1910, he thought lactobacillus tablets ah, didn't do anything, but he said that there is a certain whey formula with live lactic acid bacteria which improved depressive symptoms in adults with melancholia. So we've known about this for a very long time. What I do as an integrated partition, uh, practitioner, I'm always looking at the root cause analysis. I kind of identify the problem and I go around in a circle and as I fix things or not or new things come up, I re-identify I pause, I look to see where the blocks to cause, uh, to cure, are, and then I continue. I'm always looking to see where is the root. And sometimes you remove one layer of the onion and then you have to deal with something else. And then you remove the next layer and you deal with something else. But it's this looking for the actual, the, the nidus, getting to the splinter. You know how you get a splinter and the wound doesn't get better until you get the splinter out? You gotta go for the splinter. It's always not so easy. It could be hidden and you have to dig it out. That's what I do. Pediatrician CSI. So, in sum, depression in children is a serious disorder and has a multimodal approach of diagnosis and treatment beginning with the gut via organic food, modulation of the microbiota, and maximizing nutrients. And that's what you do. So, I'm asking you, farmers, to help me, practitioner do what I do best. So that's my book, What's Making Our Children Sick. It's about industrial food and the effect on children's health. Looked at about 20 of my patients, written with Vincent Adams. She's an amazing medical anthropologist from UCSF. The book is three years old, but it's still relevant. And when I first started working with Dr. Adams, she didn't believe a word of what I said. But after she interviewed 20 of my patients, she came around. So please, if you need to reach me, there's my email. Please check out my website. I'm the executive director of gmoscience.org, a science-based website dedicated to education about GMOs, their associated pesticides with a lens on health. So thank you for being with me and uh, hope to see you next year.